Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, distinguished delegations. I'm delighted to welcome you here. after a well-earned rest uh, over the weekend. The 21st plenary meeting of the substantive session of the United Nations Conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons leading towards their total elimination is called to order. The conference will now continue its consideration of agenda item 9 in order to consider the text circulated today by the uh, chair entitled Draft Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and contained in document A slash conf 229 slash 2017 slash CRP dot one slash rev dot one. This morning, I circulated the revised text of the draft legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. I'd like to explain to you that due to the complexity of some of the issues raised by the conference and in the text, I had to spend more time reviewing uh, the text and carrying out consultations in order to ensure that Rev 1 uh, be comprehensive and could prove a basic text to enable us to work on those outstanding areas where we believe that we have to focus our discussions this week. It is, however, important to be able to have an update. The revised text has sought to address the comments made during our first meeting, our first reading, rather, in preparing this revision, I follow the same methodology as with the first draft, looking at things article by article. This means that I, I do acknowledge that uh, a number of delegations may still be seeking views from their capitals, but I would still like to take this opportunity now to introduce the revised text in a general fashion and to give delegations an opportunity to provide a preliminary comments on this new version. In preparing this revision, I follow the same methodology as uh, we followed with the first draft. This means that overall I have continued to focus on incorporating those elements that build on points of convergence. Certainly, it's not possible in all our areas, areas to establish whether we are close to a point of convergence that could lead us to a text to be put for consideration. And I would also like to say something that uh, I think is good for the entire conference. I have sought to heed the advice of the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Madam Insume Makamitsu, who encouraged all of us to take care to produce an instrument that is legally sound, technically accurate, and politically wise. so that it can have the necessary solidity. I will look 
at the changes and the new areas and the main concepts in the revised draft. Starting literally from the top of the document, you will notice that the title of the instrument is now a treaty. This follows the clear preference expressed by many delegations to have this as the title of the uh, legally binding instrument. The change in title in no way affects the legal status of the instrument or its provisions, as we're all aware. But nominally, it rather places it on the same level of the many treaties negotiated over the decades on the issue of disarmament. The preamble incorporates many of the ideas and suggestions for which there was convergence. Unfortunately, we were able to ensure an exchange of views in the conference so that delegations could well ponder the concepts uh, shown in the preamble. The basic structure remains largely unchanged. You will recall that we had identified the main pillars in this preamble and it elaborates significantly on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and more accurately characterizes the legal basis on which this treaty will rest. It also deals with the specific groups affected, including indigenous peoples, and there is emphasis on the role of women in building peace and making progress towards disarmament. In other areas, there is also a link with the instrument, uh, the, the legal framework internationally here, and all issues of governance pertaining to disarmament, multilateral governance of disarmament. New paragraphs have been added to recall the essential principles of the United Nations to reaffirm the inalienable right to the peaceful use of nuclear energy, to recognize the importance of the full participation of women and men in all disarmament processes, and to recognize the ethical importance of disarmament education at this time as we are working on this treaty. As it stands, you will have observed that the preamble is a relatively long text in comparison to other multilateral treaties in the nuclear field and in disarmament in general. However, as many delegations stated, it was important not to sacrifice the feeling delegations have regarding the message we wish to put across for uh, present and future generations. And in order to reflect the uh, desire of delegations, we had to, to make a sacrifice to achieve a balance which we trust uh, will reflect those points that delegations felt should be included. We also hope that the preamble provides a clear and precise narrative of the motivations, principles and objectives of this process of what we are endeavouring to achieve. Looking at the operational part of the text, You've already made it known that with respect to the general obligations, 
there are no changes. Discussions were held in the various sessions when delegations voiced their desires and made specific proposals on Article 1. However, this, despite this, the President believes that there was not a sufficient room to dwell on these concerns in a way that meant the Chair would be able to proceed without taking discretional decisions, something we can't do at the moment. We want the conference to be able uh, to explore issues pertaining to Article 1 more fully. This is a treaty looking ahead, and our mandate and our aim is that it be very strong, very robust, very clear, and it is appropriately woven in with the remaining provisions in the text. La estructura del artículo. The structure of the article on the statements is now presented in a clearer fashion, and it's still very strongly linked to Article 4. But I cannot go in detail on this thematic block from uh, 2 to 5, those articles there. I must continue to indicate that, obviously, these issues here are worthy of an extremely detailed discussion. Because of the uh, novel nature of this exercise we are engaged in, to uh, uh, provide for or comment on uh, prohibition with a bridge towards the future so that there are clear bases and uh, strength again when it comes to the future and so that we leave the door open to uh, nuclear uh, weapons countries or uh, countries or considering nuclear deterrence. And so in this section, we have retained the same structure which was proposed in the original text. And we also make provision for a step forward proposing um, language for delegations to consider, providing more details there on the content of statements, and also retaining the idea that there be an article on the issue of safeguards. Over the past week, we had certain proposals, including the content of this article in other articles. And given the discussion in the room, and also because of the clear remit that we have, our mandate is to ensure that this instrument should strengthen existing architecture and complement it. We therefore believed it important to retain and uh, bolster a clear article on safeguards. I wish to underscore the fact that as a result of my consultations on this, a whole series of complex technical issues emerged where delegations have many points of view which have not led to a very clear convergence and which made it necessary further to deepen uh, the discussion here, considering the most appropriate way to include elements which previously had been in an annex in the first draft of the text. 
We want to look at the best way of incorporating these elements and also to ensure that the issue of this article fits well into the existing issue of safeguards. We know that this is crucial and we have to have a certainty that this instrument will support and complement with clarity all the existing instruments. So, given the difficulty in coming up with a language that reflects more common ground, we decided to go for simple language with an indication to the effect that this is a matter that must be clearly reflected in the treaty, but where there will uh, still be discussion. So we shall now continue to listen to what delegations have to say. We're aware of an extremely constructive spirit existing so we expect that there will be new proposals for adopting uh, this and having a special article on safeguards in the text of the treaty. The most significant innovation in the revised text is in Article 4. Following an overwhelming interest by delegations, the draft now incorporates... Or it endeavours to translate into legal provisions a very clearly expressed uh, political desire to the effect that the treaty should incorporate a way of acceding to a treaty, uh, ensuring clearly that the instrument would be available from the very first day when it comes to initiating action. The second component in the mandate of this conference is to lay down the basis for the elimination and indeed total elimination of nuclear weapons. And I would uh, like to say a particular word of thanks to the delegations of South Africa, Austria and Sweden, as well as many others, uh, for their contributions, their specific proposals and suggestions. We shall certainly continue to avail of your expertise and uh, involvement to arrive at a text that proves appropriate in reflecting the political will of states. Article 4 now provides an option for a state possessing nuclear weapons to join the treaty at an early date, subject to an obligation to eliminate its nuclear weapons program and to engage in a credible process with the other state par states' parties towards that end. A considerable amount of flexibility has been built into this approach as it must be fit to accommodate the widely differing nature of, ex of existing nuclear weapons programs, their extent and the fact that it is not possible at present to build a, a competent international authority. So we lay down the basis so that by means of the COP, it will prove possible to designate a competent international authority that could bear responsibility for verifying uh, the actual uh, dismantlement of nuclear weapons. The role of uh, the IAEA has been very carefully limited here to the verification of a nuclear material in peaceful activities in accordance with its current safeguard system. However, reflecting my recollections and record of uh, discussions in the conference, it is of interest to continue to uh, consider 
the so-called South Africa Plus pathway. And this has to be brought into line with the references uh, on the current safeguard system. This is one of the reasons explaining why, obviously, these articles have to be discussed as a block, en bloc, in a constructed process. We do indeed retain the opportunity of uh, pursuing additional protocols, including through negotiations with states not party to the treaty. These will be protocols uh, to address specific cases. And there is also the possibility that within the framework of this treaty, other types of protocols could be worked out to deal with specific issues that would prove necessary as complements. So we therefore retain, in Article 5, the possibility that many delegations believed would be appropriate, prudent and wise as an option. I do wish to say that looking at the articles uh, 2 to 5, they are then such as can provide a basis for the discussion and allow very detailed discussion on the provisions. I would like to say that in Article 9, Um, uh, institutional arrangements and action of the state's parties. There is now much more clarification on certain specific points which can be considered in the light of the various provisions that the draft already contains um, as a result of the CAP. We can have an article which could provide a guideline when it comes uh, to uh, functioning here. There is also a new provision to allow extraordinary meetings to be convened and, convened and clarification on the timing and mandates for review conferences. Uh, these are all points that delegations raised at one time or another. The changes made to Article 6 and 9 six, seven, and eight, are largely limited to the reorganization of the provisions into a more logical sequence. Again, this is the result of suggestions made by delegations. Going further ahead, The main change in the article on amendments is that it now provides for the consideration of a proposed amendment at a dedicated conference for that purpose in accordance with the normal parameters set forth in many treaties. In order to provide greater flexibility and uh, some suggestions raised in the conference. The idea is here that the, the greatest flexibility be granted to states wishing to join the treaty, particularly in the light of the Articles, Article 4. Articles 14 and 15 have been modified to allow the treaty to remain open for signature indefinitely. There are uh, precedents for this under international human rights law. Well, following many converging suggestions, the text of Article 19 has been corrected, altered and modelled on this new wording and the similar provisions in relations with other agreements which appears in the ATT, the Arms Trade Treaty. So uh, there you have a brief general introduction of 
the tweaks made to the revised text. I wish to thank all delegations for their constructive commitment over our first seven days. And we've used up seven days, so it's obvious that looking at the conference schedule, we now have fewer days. And we have a very important task facing us in homing in on those areas where we have to negotiate, ponder, and come up with solutions. In many cases, this will be innovative, enabling us to drive ahead, because I do feel that this conference is fully politically committed to concluding a legally binding instrument on the 7th of July. We therefore have a major task facing us to make such progress in negotiations and in resolving outstanding issues. So that at the end of this week and the beginning of the next, we can wrap up this exercise and find ourselves in possession of a mature text. that can go ahead for translation and other processes. I'd now like to just refer to um, the way we'll organize ourselves. If uh, you're uh, anxious to hear what we're going to do, you will recall that last week we provided you with a new indicative program. And I'd like to provide you with some additional information on what we have in mind. In this indicative timetable for our meetings this week. Now, the timetable shows that there are some open and some closed meetings. The closed meeting, to use standard terminology, using uh, the usual terminology used in the UN, the closed meetings will not be broadcast in a webcast. But they will enable the presidency, together with the Bureau, to assess things every day. so that we can decide on how to allocate time for the informal consultations, which essentially are for governments, and where they can participate for observers. There will be certain sessions which will be completely open um, we shall be able to follow the procedures we followed last week. Where there will be statements from NGOs. There will be closed meetings with NGO participation, but we felt there was a, a very positive uh, idea last week. This means there should uh, the private nature of discussion should be respected by NGOs. There should be no public recording of these meetings, including on Twitter or any other social media. As I uh, did say to you, on the basis of information available to me, this was very well received as a procedure by all conference participants. And so we shall 
uh, consider this every day with the Bureau so that we can adjust things uh, depending on the needs of the negotiations to allow access and flexibility, enabling us uh, to work in this fashion with the participation of a civil society, but uh, close to the outside world then. And then there will be certain sessions where only governments will be able to participate, only states. So we have then meetings with participation of civil society, but without um, reports to the outside world, and uh, the press will uh, be able to be there. But this means that these meetings will be off the record and there should be no reporting on any discussion. And as far as possible, we shall try to give you at least a day's notice of any need to convene consultations that involve government delegations during the regular working day for the conference. But again, we shall be assessing the situation on a daily basis with the Bureau. You will have been able to see then that this week our aim is to be flexible so that we're able to allow discussion of various issues and have specific uh, discussions again on those areas where more uh, work is needed, more discussion is needed. I did say, as I started to speak here, that some delegations may still be awaiting instructions from their capitals, but um, after this general introduction, now I shall open the floor to any delegation which may wish to make general comments, and by this I in no way wish uh, to uh, prejudice our resuming a conversation tomorrow so that the entire conference, including specialists, and uh, civil society activists can make their contributions, express their views on this new version we have. We trust that it truly does reflect the progress made by the conference. I would say quite frankly here that th this progress is extremely significant, but now we have to look at the details and wrap up the outstanding issues. In a personal capacity, I must say that I'm very pleased at the headway we made and the very constructive spirit that prevailed in the conference, which I'm sure will also be the spirit in doing this in the future. I should now like to open the floor to any delegations who may wish to make general comments on this first Rev 1 of the text of the treaty. In este momento tiene la palabra. The delegation of Iran now has the floor, followed by Austria. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. Good afternoon, everybody. Madam President, thank you for all your hard work in preparing the revised draft treaty. We appreciate it. We expected to receive the revised draft last night. However, as soon as we get the text around 10 o'clock this morning, we sent it to the capital. While we are still await instructions from Tehran, I would like to make some preliminary comments on the revised draft. Madam President, since the start of this conference, my delegation has stressed that it is of crucial importance to reach a common understanding on 
what we are aiming to achieve at this conference. Are we negotiating an instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons, or we are negotiating an instrument on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and their destruction? In accordance with the UNGA, Resolution 71-258, the conference is mandated to negotiate an instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. The UNGA has not mandated this conference to negotiate a comprehensive instrument which includes both prohibition of nuclear weapons and their destruction. Iran is a strong advocate of a comprehensive convention. However, we are well aware that negotiating a comprehensive convention is neither practical nor achievable in this conference given the available time frame, time limit. For this reason, in the course of the first reading of the draft, my delegation proposed the deletion of Article 224 regarding declaration, safeguards and elimination of nuclear weapons, and verification standards in the post-disarmament situation. Such provisions do belong to a comprehensive instrument. Such provisions are highly technical and complex matters which have to be thoroughly considered, discussed, and their implications need to be assessed carefully. Retention of such provisions in the revised draft and their further elaboration clearly indicates that the instrument has gone beyond the prohibition treaty and has aimed to be a comprehensive convention. If this path chosen by the drafters of the text, in the view of Iran's delegation, the text has many deficiencies with regard to declarations, safeguards, and the verification standards for the post-disarmament situation. We look at this text as a legally binding text. We cannot take it lightly. A legally binding treaty that leaves open many questions with respect to declarations and safeguards and the verification standard in the post-elimination situation would be very harmful for the future of nuclear disarmament endeavor. Iran will not be in a position to agree with such an approach. In addition, to concerns with respect to Article 224, Madam President, we have other concerns about the revised draft. We note with great concern that some of the critical proposals made by my delegation on the preamble and Article 1 that received a remarkable support of many delegations in this room are completely overlooked in the revised draft. For example, the issue of the threat of use and the reaffirmation of the declaration of the UNGA that the use of nuclear weapons is a crime against humanity. In the preambular part, the prohibition to threaten to use nuclear weapons and the prohibition of all kinds of nuclear weapon tests, as well as the prohibition of the transit of nuclear weapons in Article 1, is among the, those issues. The complex issue of probable non-compliance of those states whose declaration were affirmative is also among the issues that have not been touched uh, by this text. Madam President, it is time to get to the negotiating phase in the proper setting. The revised text is far from a consensus text. We have a lot of work ahead of us. We should work diligently in the remaining days to resolve the outstanding issues and reach an agreed text. My delegation is ready to work with you and other delegation in this regard. I thank you, Madam President. I should like to thank this distinguished delegation of Iran and now give the floor to the delegation of Austria, followed by Ecuador, Malaysia, and Argentina. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, I would like to thank you, but also your team and the Secretariat who have worked so hard to provide us uh, with the revised version. And it is uh, certainly not an easy task after the rich discussions that we had until now. But I think uh, uh, we can see that we are uh, really making progress and it is quite good. And at the same time, we can also uh, uh, see that uh, on certain issues, we will need more work, as you have said yourself. And uh, this is certainly the case with regard to Article 2 to 5. Uh, 
as you have said, uh, uh, a number of delegations, uh, including my own, has uh, uh, provided uh, you with uh, some ideas how to uh, go about this, and we can see uh, that uh, these ideas, having spoken with so many of our colleagues here, had a lot of uh, acceptance. And some of those ideas are now contained in the draft, uh, uh, for which I also want to thank you. But there are a number of issues that we still have to complement here. This is in particular with regard to Article 2, the, the, the declarations of uh, countries that now, when they exceed uh, to the treaty, own or possess nuclear weapons and nuclear explosive devices, because in A, we just have the past and they have already eliminated. But what about those who have them? So I think we will need here uh, further language on this. And also on declarations, we will need language. What about those um, uh, states on which territory nuclear weapons are stationed? I think it would be good that they also could declare it. And um, this has repercussions, certainly, on Article 4. Uh, so there again, uh, we have to have language with regard to uh, stationed nuclear weapons on the territory, but certainly also with regard to uh, a more uh, precise uh, a version with regard uh, to countries that own or possess nuclear weapons. Turning now to Article 3, safeguards, uh, as you have so rightly said, it's very difficult uh, to formulate it because uh, we know that uh, safeguards agreements exist and uh, they are in the perimeter of the IEA and uh, I think uh, uh, everybody agrees that we do not at all want to interfere in this. Uh, but they have a high importance for the object and purpose also of this treaty. Uh, and when we look, uh, now it's only one mm, paragraph under Article 3, and uh, what we are missing is to express uh, that uh, uh, all countries uh, uh, should conclude safeguards uh, agreements. Uh, we have just here um, at the minimum maintain, but what about if uh, there are no... I know there are only relatively uh, few countries that do not have this, but I think it's really a, a treaty that is going to cover everything, uh, and uh, so we will have to address this. Uh, my delegation is certainly ready to continue to work with other delegations on this issue and to provide you, together with so many other delegations, here with some complementary language. Another point that I wanted to raise is, um, and this is not a criticism at all, of course, uh, under Article 14 we talk about the signature. And uh, we think uh, usually in such treaties uh, we put in uh, when and where this treaty will be opened for signature. And uh, so it might be a good idea that we express here that this treaty shall be open for signature uh, to all states at the UN headquarters in New York from the 20th of September or whatever date, 2017. I mean, the attraction of uh, the 20th uh, September would be that is uh, during the uh, general debate, a uh, high level segment of the General Assembly, and that would uh, facilitate it uh, for our ministers who will come here to, to, to sign the treaty. Uh, so that's a rather practical uh, suggestion, and uh, we would be happy uh, to see this uh, um, included 
Of course, we have some, some minor points, but uh, I think we, uh, this could be very easily uh, be fixed. They are not of a conceptual nature, and that again testifies to the good basis that we have achieved, and we are certainly looking forward to work with you and all other delegations that we meet our common objective to finalize this treaty in time to adopt it on the 7th of July. And as you have pointed out, uh, time is running and we have to make progress very quickly. Thank you. I thank the distinguished uh, delegation of Austria. Let me give the floor now to, permítame la palabra la delegación. May I now give the floor to the delegation of Ecuador, followed by Malaysia. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, and my thanks go to you and your team uh, for the endeavours that you've made uh, over the long weekend as well. I think that we must pay tribute to the hard work that you've done. And like previous delegations, my comments are really general. Looking at the preamble, it's not doesn't perhaps have everything that all delegations would have wanted, but we do think it does reflect the opinions of the majority of delegations. There could be one or two small changes, but we think it's setting us on the right road. And uh, it, it, the preamble is longer, but we're still uh, shorter than the preamble on the uh, prohibition of cluster weapons. So well, we're still within a reasonable stage. Now, looking at Article 1, I'm not going to embark on specific proposals now. Uh, indeed, I will be coming to an issue of procedure as I uh, conclude what I'm saying. It, we do have uh, your original version here, so this doesn't include the proposals that my delegation or other delegations brought forward. However, as you're aware, Madam President, uh, there are uh, proposals uh, that my delegation last Friday indeed uh, sent to the Secretariat with a specific alternative language on transit and I shall be presenting these uh, when the time comes. Now looking at Articles 2 to 5, yes, it's interesting here, the treaty looking at its title is on prohibition. So therefore the most significant article, well all articles are important, would be Article 1. This is certainly uh, giving rise to the uh, to the, the area there where there is most uh, convers most discussion. Uh, those are the articles two to five. Now, looking at the full mandate, uh, it's on negotiating a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons, leading to their total elimination. We believe that both of these aspects are important. So. I would put what is more of a methodological question on these articles. Should we aim more at certain framework articles which could be developed further depending on circumstances and what uh, all states decide, or states with nuclear weapons, or should we have uh, provisions that are a bit more specific, a bit more precise, as it were? My capital is still studying this, but I think we should take the two alternatives into account. The way forward here is not the only one. There would be other ways of laying down very firm uh, bases and considering what would be done in the case of the accession of uh, more st states, particularly those with the nuclear weapons, but allowing the conference of states parties to decide the exact procedures to be followed in those circumstances, or something uh, combining those. But this is an element in the treaty that does have a degree of importance, just because of the fact that our instrument is intended to uh, take us on a future course towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Looking at Article 6 to 8, there are no major changes there, just one or two tweaks to 7 and 8. Uh, looking at 6, the, the reference... 
we don't need the reference uh, pursuant to constitutional processes. That uh, goes without saying. It's fine. But in Article 7, as uh, has been stated in the debate, it's a question of striking a balance here. The uh, primordial responsibility of the state of jurisdiction must be retained and uh, must be reasserted. Uh, by way of an example, let's say there's an accident on First Avenue here. We're not supposed to wait until the driver of the vehicle that caused the accident comes back to deal with the victims. Uh, we have uh, to help the injured. So this is then the priority. We have to look at things from the point of view of the victims, those who need assistance. And then again, as other de delegations have said, we uh, cannot overlook the fact that there are uh, responsibilities here. So there's the balance, which I don't think is as, as yet enshrined, but when it comes to the point of view of the victims, uh, this article needs to be further strengthened. And the same thing holds good with regard to uh, remedies for the environment, rehabilitation of the environment. You're aware, Ecuador, in uh, its constitution, recognizes rights to nature. And so uh, the state of the environment uh, is not a responsibility for nobody. Uh, Rehabilitative action, rehabilitative action has to be taken and certainly the responsibility of the state of jurisdiction comes into play. But this jurisdictional responsibility does not remove a responsibility from states responsible for environmental damage. And then Article 9 refers to the attributions of the CAP. We welcome this. We note, though, as well, that the proposal was to synchronize the COP meetings with the review conference, which would be every six years. We think this is a good alternative. If we look at Article 11, there's something new here. We have to look at the precedents, not just because of the existence of amendments, but because a new sort of conference is being mooted, an amending conference, in the con context of a, a two-yearly cycle of uh, states' parties. It could be that there's uh, such urgency regarding an amendment that there has to be a meeting uh, convened very rapidly to deal with the amendment. No, that's not the case. The amendments should be brought to the COPs, but we have to bear cost in mind if we have to have meetings just to discuss amendments and not allow the COPs to deal with that. Then I, I think the distinguished ambassador of Austria made an interesting proposal regarding the date for a, a signature, the opening date, considering that on the 7th we should adopt a text Ecuador would have signed it during the uh, general debate in the UN. And then there's also the s treaty uh, signature ceremony, which would be very appropriate to allow ministers or even heads of state uh, who may wish to be present um, so to do. However, this is something that we can uh, discuss. First of all, we've got to reach our goal on the 7th of July. Then regarding um, withdrawal from the treaty, as you're aware, from what we said previously on this, Ecuador would prefer that there were no provision whatsoever allowing withdrawal from the treaty. This is pursuant to the uh, Vienna Convention on Treaty Law. In any case, we do say that the proposal, as it stands here, appears to us to be too simple. This is too serious, too important a treaty to allow I think the maximum period here would be six months to allow a state just to withdraw like that. My delegation would quite simply prefer that uh, it should not be possible to withdraw from this treaty. Then lastly, on methodology, madam, and the meeting schedule, 
you mentioned on several uh, occasions, as did other delegations, the fact that we don't have much time. And when there isn't much time, we have to make the best possible use of it. As you uh, did say, some articles have not been changed in Article 1, considering the first draft, the first version of the draft. So, and I say this very respectfully, all delegations uh, uh, still have to make their comments on this new version of the draft, but once that has happened, I think if we do have some time, then we should immediately start to discuss Article 1, perhaps even this afternoon. Because, I take it, well, every delegation is going to know this, so the instructions won't have changed. Article 1 is exactly the same that we had before. We've got it in front of us, so we could start to negotiate it uh, this afternoon. It's a first uh, revision, but uh, you will recall that there were uh, no further uh, proposals on that. We do have proposals on this article. We want to discuss things, we want to, to negotiate, and we feel we should start straight away. We can make quite a lot of headway in an hour, and if we do find ourselves with an hour this afternoon, and if you so decree, Madam President, we could start on Article 1 straight away, as it's the same one that was there at the beginning. And then, my last comment, and I am coming to the end now, We do realize that, as is normal in all negotiations, there will be moments when states will have to uh, confabulate to discuss specific points. And maintaining the distinction here between open meetings and closed ones, we believe that the greatest encouragement uh, should be given to civil society, Madam Chair. Uh, the, the Chair should welcome civil society uh, under the conditions that you spelt out. But this not just because civil society has played an important role in the process leading to this discussion, but also in uh, 71258. This is part of the resolution, uh, the part of the mandate. Uh, so uh, certain times states will have to go into small huddles to deal with different issues, but I think we could still keep civil society in the room. Thank you very much, Madam uh, President. We are willing, ready to start negotiating this very afternoon. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Delegation of Ecuador. The delegation of Malaysia has the floor, then Argentina, Cuba. La delegación de Malasia. Malaysia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. And may we take this opportunity to thank you and your team for the tremendous work that you have undertaken um, in the past weeks and, and over the course of this long weekend. We are waiting for the instructions as other delegations are from capital, but uh, at this point we wish to share some of our preliminary views and initial reactions to the text at hand. We see that this revised text of the treaty has a positive basis to continue with this conference's responsibility to conclude by 7th July a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. We see that there have been a number of improvements and that this revised text brings together the positions and comments expressed during the first reading of the original draft and the proposals that have been put forward. We note that in the efforts that you have taken, you have sought to balance the positions and comments expressed while ensuring that the different articles of the convention make a comprehensive whole and a coherent, legally sound document that state parties would be able to understand and implement. We do see uh, some of these improvements, for example, in the preamble, which is clear, clearer for us now, and lays the conceptual framework for the treaty. We see that Article 1 remains the same, but we are and maintain the view that the language and prohibitions contained in Article 1 addresses the whole spectrum of prohibited activities. In terms of Articles 2 and 4, we appreciate that this, the structure in terms of the language regarding declarations and verifications are clearer, but having said that, for the work is needed, as others have said, and we very much agree, to ensure that any conceivable scenarios and the processes contained within 2 and 4 are improved. Article 3 on safeguards is also improved, in our view, to balance the need to, one, not interfere with existing regime, 
while ensuring that safeguard standards not lowered, yet at the same time not making as mandatory obligations which are not, and we appreciate that and further work could be done. With regards to Article 6, uh, so I apologize, Article 7, the new Article 7 um, on victims assistance and environmental remediation, the change in title is positive. It gives better clarity to what we're speaking about here. And we still look forward to having language in there that talks about the primary responsibility of the state which had engaged in use or testing. Article 9 on MSP is also clearer. There are many tasks given to the MSP in this new revised Article 9. However, this is inevitable and necessary as much of the matters that would be discussed require further deliberation beyond what should go into the instrument now and beyond the time available in this conference to discuss what those matters would be. We are generally satisfied with the institutional arrangements in Articles 10 to 1 and appreciate that the amendment procedure in Article 11 has been strengthened. We heard and take note of what our colleague from Ecuador said about whether there is indeed a necessity to have a separate amendment conference other than the provisions in there with regard to having amendments discussed at the MSP and at the review conference. That is a valid point and I'm sure that is something that could be discussed and further worked out. And we appreciate that Article 19 on the relationship with other agreements is clearer and more inclusive. As we stated, uh, this draft is a good basis to continue, but further work needs to be done, and we look forward to that process. If we can say a little, uh, Madam President, just about the procedure, at this stage, um, in the view of my delegation, it is very important that we focus on the language and look at the issues from a legal and practically implementable standpoint. We had a first reading, views and positions were expressed, and as far as we were concerned, we were negotiating then, just as we are and will be negotiating now. The text, as we move forward, should not be overloaded with issues that could trigger major political divisions or technical debate. And in this regard, we appeal again that delegations need to be circumspect and focus, and not focus on specific issues that would be either unrealistic to implement or do not enjoy consensus in the conference, as we knew that and, and we had seen that in the first reading. The end goal of this conference, which I'm sure all delegations share, is a successful conclusion that would result in the adoption of this treaty on 7th July. We should not divert our attention from that goal. All delegations need to exert all efforts and be flexible and work together, together and with you, Madam President, and your team to ensure that this collective goal is met, especially in the time that we have. We need to discuss, we need to improve the text, but that time still remains limited. For us, for my delegation, we will continue to take a constructive approach and we are ready to continue in any manner which you feel would move us forward in that direction. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of Malaysia. Le doy la palabra a la delegación from Nagas to the distinguished delegation of Argentina, followed by Cuba. Gracias, señora Presidente. Thank you very much, Madam President. May I express to you uh, the uh, gratitude of uh, the delegation of Argentina for your hand on the helm at this uh, conference, your conduct thereof, and uh, the new version you've presented us with. I I'd just like to give you a few very brief uh, preliminary comments because we did send this new version to Buenos Aires this morning. Firstly, Referring to the draft for a preamble, uh, paragraph 18, uh, this is a paragraph of interest uh, with, uh, uh, for my delegation. We uh, agree with the presentation uh, on the 15th of uh, June and the TMP being the cornerstone regarding the regime on uh, non-proliferation. Now, in Article 1, we believe that the general observation should include concepts of elimination in a new point 3 and subsequent points. We did send the language to the Secretariat in the past uh, on this. And looking at obligations, we suddenly find that there are provisions in the draft treaty on verification, but no obligations on elimination. And uh, the other way around, we see that there is a pro prohibition on uh, nuclear trials, but there's no uh, verification of this prohibition. So we think that we'll have to do a little bit of work on there. And then on um, safeguards, 
we believe that 2.1b and Article 3, the specific one on safeguards, need uh, to be rendered uh, tighter in the way in which they're couched. Uh, delegations uh, did present a language that uh, could prove satisfactory to my delegation, re again regarding to the refer to the um, NTP. And then, as was mentioned this morning, the safeguards uh, should include a paragraph which was in the annex. Uh, you proposed it in the first draft of the um, uh, first draft, transcribing uh, Article 3.2 on the provision of um, material and technology in the NPT. We think it's important uh, in a provision uh, there on nuclear weapons. And again, for us. We won't take up too much time now, but we will um, have something to say when we've re re read the new draft. Thank you. Thank you very much, Argentina. Cuba now has the Thank you very much, Madam President. I should like to start by thanking you and your team and the Secretariat for the extremely hard work that you've put in to prepare this revised version of the treaty. We think that this new draft being proposed is a new step forward towards our aim of, on the 7th of July, approving a treaty on prohibition. We think that the revised version does take a duly uh, into account the various proposals that uh, delegations have submitted. However, at the same time, we do feel that it uh, still requires a lot of work, Madam President, and certain changes, significant changes, will have to be written into the text in order to bolster this treaty and ensure that we appropriately I comply with the mandate given to us by the General Assembly. I shall for now just restrict myself to voicing some of our basic concerns. For, forgive me, just looking at the new version, are obviously studying it very carefully and uh, we shall make more specific comments in the future when we've looked at it, but I'd just like to underscore two or three of our major concerns now. Looking at Article 1, I have to say again that for Cuba, Article 1 is the most important one in the entire treaty. We're working on a treaty on prohibition, and without failing to recognize the uh, merit that the other articles have, Article 1 is of priority for us, on Article on General Obligations. Now, we are concerned that the prohibition in Article 1 is solely that on the use of nuclear weapons, and no reference is made to an explicit reference to the threat to use nuclear weapons. For Cuba, this is of great importance of the utmost importance, and if we see any exclusion regarding the threat of use here, we believe this would have a negative impact on the strength of the uh, prohibition intended to be enshrined in the treaty. And then again, we are concerned at the fact that in Article 1, the sole prohibition here is um, on trials of uh, explosive uh, nuclear weapons. So we would be allowing the sort of tests that are more frequent uh, at present without actually exploding the devices. I refer here to subcritical tests and other sorts of simulations. We do underscore how vital it is for the treaty to contain an explicit prohibition on all nuclear weapons tests, including those which are carried out without explosions. We also believe that it's 
negative that, again, there is no explicit provision in Article 1 of the transit of nuclear weapons. We live in Latin America and the Caribbean, in that region, and we have uh, the uh, negative experience that our uh, Treaty of Tratiluca, which created an area free of nuclear weapons in our area, doesn't contain an explicit uh, prohibition of the transit of nuclear weapons there. And we have seen that there are indeed uh, negative results of this. So I think experience teaches us that it's extremely important that this prohibition on transit be included in the final version of the treaty. Then on the preamble, just a minor comment. I think that at present various significant ideas that delegations raised have been included. However, we believe that the last version has left out something very important, that is the explicit reference to the negative implications of the threat to use nuclear weapons. We understand that there has been an attempt to replace an explicit reference by a, a much weaker, more general reference to the provisions of the UN Charter in connection with the uh, threat of the use of force in general terms. We think that this sort of language which um, avoids the explicit uh, prohibition on the uh, threat to use nuclear weapons uh, in the last analysis weakens the treaty. Then on Article 2, we believe that the scope of the declarations, the statements being proposed, is too restricted. And this sort of statement is not consistent with the content of Article 1 of the treaty. And here again, I would like to reassert our position to the effect that the statements set forth in the treaty, the obligations, have appropriately to reflect what is in Article 1 on general obligations. So again, I, I don't wish to speak for too long because we shall be producing our proposal in discussions. But again, on the issues from 2 to 5, Articles 2 to 5, the Cuban delegation fully understands how complex this is and how tough it is for you and your team to try to come up with something that's acceptable to everybody. There's no magic solution, no magic formula to deal with such a sensitive issue as we have, with the states really possessing nuclear weapons and the need to ensure that this treaty is a step on the way towards the total elimination of nuclear weapons. We shall study the language you propose to us for Articles 2 to 5 with the greatest of care. I would just like to anticipate to you the fact that we are not fully convinced that in the context of this treaty it's necessary to establish, say, some sort of new international authority responsible for verification uh, of the destruction of nuclear weapons. So I would conclude there, Madam, uh, and I obviously wish to assure you once again of how the Cuban delegation will continue to work constructively and with good faith together with you and other delegations. Thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished delegation of Cuba and I now give the floor to the delegation of Palestine followed by Ireland, the Netherlands and Nigeria. Thank you. Madam President, and uh, we also want to extend our thanks to you and to your team and to the Secretariat, uh, and while retaining the right to make further general or specific comments after more extensive review of the draft, we wish to make the following comments at this uh, juncture. Uh, we want to commend you because we consider that the draft has been improved in key aspects, uh, both in the preambular part and in the operative uh, parts of the Convention. Uh, we believe that it addressed a number of uh, loopholes and one of the most important worries we had is the creation of the 
binary or discriminatory system with unnecessary distinctions between those who had moved forward on nuclear disarmament and those who had not. And we believe some of that has been addressed despite still existing worries relating to Article 2, specifically Article 2, Para 1A. Uh, we believe that uh, while uh, a lot of the comments had been addressed in the preambular paragraphs, these also need to be reflected. What we have added in the preambular paragraphs needs to be reflected once we arrive to the articles themselves because these preambular paragraphs have implications, including on the scope of prohibitions. Uh, and we believe there that there were some uh, suggestions by states, including ourselves, on expanding the scope of prohibition, also to include, among others, the threat of use of nuclear weapons, and we be believe this is consistent with the views that were reflected here and with the added preambular uh, paragraphs. We also believe there must be clarity regarding state responsibilities. There are responsibilities that fall on certain states that should not be deviated away from them, and there are responsibilities that don't lie on other uh, states. So we need to make sure that whatever we are putting in there as responsibilities falling on states to be legitimate and consistent with uh, international law. We also believe, given the nature of the prohibition and the commitment of states here, and the reasons behind uh, drafting this convention that there should not be a possibility for withdrawal. We know the argument that says that making it easier to withdraw makes it easier to exceed, but we believe, uh, given what we are saying in the preambular paragraphs about why we arrived to this conclusion, uh, that allowing uh, states to refer to any given interests uh, to withdraw from this convention and the prohibition it formulates uh, is rather uh, dangerous. We hope also that we will be able, in the specific comments, to address any ambiguity uh, on regarding the processes, the decision-making, uh, including by state parties, and who's responsible, which authorities are responsible for what. Some of the suggestions that are in there are still too open uh, and need to be clarified and determined. We truly thank you for all the efforts that have been put into this, and we believe this brings us much closer. Uh, to an agreement on a, on a text for the convention. Thank you. I should like to thank the distinguished delegation of Palestine. And I now give the floor to the delegation of Ireland, followed by the Netherlands. Thank you, Madam President. My delegation welcomes the issuing of this REV1, and we would like to thank you and your team for all of your work. We believe our text is moving well and in the right direction, and we see that many of the issues which we have all been discussing here in the room are reflected in the REV1. As you have invited, I would like to make some preliminary general remarks at this time. On the preamble, we're especially pleased with the evolution of the preamble, which we believe is a good balance and a fair reflection of the views expressed in our discussions on the revised preamble which you had issued earlier as a conference paper. And we share your belief that the somewhat longer text is warranted in this case. Coming to the operative part of the draft, we also note good progress and a number of positive developments here. On Article 3 on safeguards, which many states have identified as significant, we do have some preliminary concerns on a potential loophole regarding accession of countries without nuclear weapons that are also without safeguards, as our Austrian colleague has mentioned earlier. But we will study this issue more closely at a technical level, and we will revert on this, possibly with a language proposal to address the concern. And we will also be very happy, as we have been up to now, to work constructively on this issue with others. On Articles 2 to 5, generally as a cluster, we do appreciate, as you have said, that this is one of the more challenging clusters and deserving of our detailed discussion and consideration and further work. We have listened carefully to your introduction of the new text here. We see it as going in a constructive direction, but given the complexity, we will wish to study the draft carefully and consult with capital before reverting further. 
Also, as we view Article 9 on the meetings of states' parties as closely related to the provisions in Articles 2 to 5, we will also study the new text of Article 9 in conjunction with 2 to 5 and revert with some further thoughts. We will have some points to raise on other articles, including on Article 7, and we will have some other points of clarification. But we will come to these in our detailed discussions as our work progresses this week. In this regard, I would like to thank my colleague from Malaysia for his remarks earlier, encouraging us all to remain focused on our key objectives. And finally, my delegation would also like to very much welcome the return here of our civil society partners who support us so significantly in our achieving our collective goals here. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of uh, Ireland. Delega the delegation of uh, Netherlands has the floor followed by Nigeria. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Madam Chair, or Madam President, uh, apologies. Let me start by thanking you for your uh, continued efforts in leading these negotiations and the hard work of you and your team putting together this new draft, especially over the long weekend. Having studied the text this morning, we would like to make some preliminary comments, and of course our delegation as well as Capital is still studying the draft in more detail. And based on the outcome of this process, we will, might come up with further comments and suggestions over the next couple of days. Madam President, our delegation has been engaging actively in the discussions based on the first draft of the text. We indicated our concerns, for instance, on the verifiability of the treaty and its compatibility with our commitments as a member of NATO. We have made several proposals aiming, for example, to make the draft treaty more effective and clear as well as to bring it into line with existing structures so that it would reinforce and not compete with existing instruments. We recognize, of course, that negotiating a text requires flexibility. However, I would nevertheless like to express our disappointment that our proposals have not or insufficiently been incorporated in the new text of the treaty. In some ways, the new text is an improvement over previous versions, However, the new text has not taken away our concerns and in some areas even increased them. These concerns are especially related to the effectiveness of the instrument as a step towards nuclear disarmament and to its relationship with existing instruments such as the CTBT and the MPT, including Article 6 of that treaty. Madam President, our number one goal here is and remains taking a significant step towards the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. In our view, any proposed instrument will not constitute an effective step towards a nuclear weapon-free world if it fails to encourage elementary steps such as the development and universal adoptions of safeguards that can guarantee, efficiently and beyond a doubt, the absence of nuclear weapon-related activities in all states. The effectiveness of our safeguards mechanism becomes more, not less, important as nuclear, armament, our nuclear disarmament progresses. It is our precondition for reaching global zero. The current text, however, fails to encourage states, states' parties to ratify an additional protocol and to adopt even higher standards in the future. This, in our view, does not contribute to making progress towards a nuclear weapon-free world. It might even encourage resignation to the current situation. The Netherlands would therefore like to reiterate a suggestion to not only include the additional protocol in Article 3 of the draft text, but also to clearly codify a commitment of member states to develop and adopt higher standards of verification. Furthermore, the current text of the treaty still does not make sufficiently clear how it intends to engage with nuclear weapon possessor states. On the one hand, it contains provisions for such states to join and then disarm. On the other hand, it insufficiently recognizes the issues that need to be dealt with before such states would take this step. I am in this context not only referring to our security-related considerations, but also to the development of an effective mechanism to verify nuclear disarmament. And these factors are crucial to make this treaty an effective step towards disarmament. Madam President, the Netherlands is worried about the direction the treaty text is taking with regards to its relationship with existing instruments. It does not address the concerns we have expressed regarding its overlap with the CTBT. In this context, I would like to refer back to our previous statements. 
Regarding the MPT, we have heard strong support for the MPT during our consultations and that delegations consider this instrument to be a step towards the implementation of Article 6 of the MPT and complement the treaty. We share these views. However, the relationship between this treaty and the crucial importance of the MPT has not been sufficiently reflected in the draft in our view. Instead, we note with concern that the reference to the MPT in the preamble um, is not as strong as we wished, and that the revised Article 19 contains language that risks undermining the, MP, uh, the authority of the MPT by subordinating it to the prohibition. Let me elaborate. We consider the MPT to be the cornerstone of the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime, and we are happy that this is reflected in the text. It is the only legally binding framework that includes an obligation to disarm on the nuclear weapon states, as well as binding non-proliferation commitments for 191 states. We should not create a competing instrument or structure that risks undermining this framework. The goal of this treaty, rather, is to strengthen, not, is to strengthen the MPT regime. We would therefore like to make a number of suggestions on the outset. First, including the preamble, a clear reaffirmation of the commitments of all states' parties to the implementation of the MPT. We are of the view that this should be a simple and non-objectionable addition, considering we are all states' parties to the MPT. Secondly, we suggest to include a preambular paragraph recognizing that a legally binding prohibition of nuclear weapons constitutes a step in the framework of Article 6 of the Treaty of Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons towards the achievement of irreversible, verifiable and transparent elimination of nuclear weapons. Thirdly, Article 19 provides that the treaty is without prejudice to international legal instruments such as the MPT and CTBT, where the obligations therein do not conflict with the prohibitions contained in this treaty. This suggests that in case of conflict, the prohibition would take precedence. We therefore strongly suggest to replace Article 19 with a provision that reads, in case of any conflict between this instrument and the NPT, the provisions of the NPT and their interpretation prevail, or words to that effect. Fourth, in addition, we would like to ensure the integrity of the NPT by including a paragraph that states that adherence to the NPT is an obligation under the Convention. Madam Chair, we are currently working on specific text proposals in this regard, which we will be able to present tomorrow after we have, uh, hopefully, when we, after we have received instruction from Capital. And in the meanwhile, let me reassure you that the Netherlands stands ready to cooperate with all delegations here to address these and other issues of concern, and we look forward to constructive discussions to this end over the next few days. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of um, the Netherlands. Let me give the floor to the delegation of Nigeria, followed by Costa Rica and Mozambique. Uh, Madam President, uh, good afternoon, and thank you so very much for the text you have laid before us. Uh, it's holiday back home in my country, but that will not uh, uh, kind of uh, stop us from making some useful comments this afternoon. Madam President, uh, let, me, let me start by going back to what you said earlier when you uh, uh, briefed us uh, on what you have uh, given us this afternoon. You said that, that uh, you quoted the um, High uh, Representative for Disarmament Affairs that uh, the instrument we are here to negotiate uh, has to be legally sound, it has to be technically accurate and politically wise. Somehow we believe uh, the text you have given us is moving in that direction. Of course, uh, there will be a uh, point here and there on the need to uh, further broaden what we have here to deepen the, the work. Uh, but we would like to agree uh, with the, dele uh, delegation, the delegate of uh, Malaysia in calling us uh, to uh, not only remain constructively engaged but to also be flexible in going, going forward with this work. Uh, Madam President, of course, uh, as I said, we, we will be awaiting uh, some uh, uh, detailed uh, briefing from uh, uh, the capital. But then, uh, on the face value, we can quickly point out some things that we find we have found uh, quite useful in what you have given to us. 
we found out that the preamble uh, is uh, a good work and uh, indeed you have uh, uh, developed uh, and taken into consideration uh, a number of proposals and suggestions we uh, have uh, given in the, the past uh, meetings particularly in reflecting articulately, articulately the broad tenor of Resolution 71258. Uh, Madam President, if we move uh, to Article 1, uh, we know that uh, we, the, the objective of uh, uh, the treaty is actually to prohibit and ban. So we believe somehow it, that has to be uh, immediately reflected coming from the preamble, then going straight to the article in whatever way, form or shape it will be. But uh, it has to read uh, uh, somewhere between the objective of this treaty is to ensure we, we are okay with what you have outlined. They are good and then they, they actually uh, uh, they, they, they conform to what we have going forward in the text. Uh, Madam President, uh, we believe uh, the current uh, Article 2, uh, we, we did highlight some, some, some issues there uh, for us to maintain a present continuous, particularly when you were looking at uh, uh, only those country, countries that owned or possessed nuclear weapons in the past. So we can, we can make it uh, a present continuous, but uh, we, we remain in your hands uh, on that. Uh, we found out that uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a big improvement on uh, article, the former uh, Article 6 that uh, you have now uh, uh, presented to us as Article 7, in, in, including it, uh, uh, the, the addition of environmental remediation. Uh, article 8, you have broadened it further, and we, we, we found that uh, initially what we said was uh, uh, if uh, we won't, we won't uh, sharpen it, we could as well remove it. But uh, you have uh, done uh, a good work on that. And uh, basically, that will be our initial comments. But uh, we also want to seize the opportunity to, to thank you and your team for a good work. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of Nigeria. The delegation of Costa Rica has the floor, then Mozambique and South Africa. Thank you very much, Madam President. Costa Rica was uh, very pleased indeed at this new text of the treaty, and we should like to thank you very much for everything that you and your team have done to arrive at this revised text. We note some significant progress in the document, particularly looking at the preamble, which appropriately reflects the proposals made by delegations. We now have a much more solid and clearer text. May I just uh, make a few preliminary observations? The preamble should reflect the reasons and concerns pertaining to this treaty, re recognizing um, ethic uh, 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 imperatives uh, for uh, the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the uh, disastrous uh, consequences of their use, and uh, these concerns must be adequately reflected. The preamble must also reflect the needs of the victims and the disproportionate impact that nuclear weapons have on women and children and indigenous peoples. And again, the preamble should refer to the risks of an accidental explosion uh, one that is calculated or intended as well. And this new version manages appropriately to amalgamate all these concepts which are of key importance for my delegation. Costa Rica also welcomes the fact that the PP9 has uh, been strengthened in order to reflect the basis of international humanitarian law protecting uh, civilian uh, uh, populations and uh, fighters, uh, pre pre preventing indiscriminate attacks and uh, excessive uh, suffering, uh, re re mentioning there some of the elements which did not appear in the previous text. We welcome the fact that there's also in PP12, uh, there's a specific reference to 26 of the Charter urging us um, to uh, promote and establish international peace and security. 
use using uh, economic um, resources of the world as little as possible regarding uh, weapons. This is very important for Costa Rica given the disproportionate and multi-million investment that nuclear weapons countries devote to the production, maintenance and modernization of nuclear weapons. And these could be used to change the paradigm that we so want to see. Uh, considering human safety and international law before deterrence, we have the use and or e um, threat to use uh, force. This is in uh, PP14 as well. For Costa Rica, we very much wish to retain the specific reference to the need to act uh, for a general and complete international disarmament under uh, severe international control uh, as per paragraph 16. Uh, here there is a reference uh, to um, Article 6 of the NPT, and we have to uh, bear this uh, very much in mind. We also emphasize Paragraph 22, where reference is made to strengthening uh, real participation of women in nuclear disarmament. This again reflects the active and growing participation of women in international peace and security and the quality of their work and uh, also positive education for disarmament uh, is mentioned in paragraph 23. However, Costa Rica believes that we could and should be even more ambitious, much more ambitious when it comes to the uh, positive obligations arising from the treaty uh, in line with the standards uh, in other uh, instruments uh, here. For example, the rehabilitation of the environment in Article 7.2 should be an obligation uh, for a, a when there are affected states, and there should be stronger provisions on cooperation and uh, assistance, uh, international cooperation assistance in Article 8. In the future, we shall be submitting language on these issues. Uh, then again, I would like to refer specifically to Articles 2, 5, 7 1, 9, and uh, 16 in the text of the treaty. Costa Rica acknowledges the Chair's endeavors regarding Articles 2 to 5 and the desire of delegations to come forward with alternatives to countries with nuclear weapons to urge them to accede to the treaty. We believe that the proposals here constitute a good basis for negotiation. And in particular, we'd like to underscore the progress in Article 4.1 in order to withdraw operational ability of nuclear weapon systems and the uh, call uh, on states to destroy them as swiftly uh, as possible to destroy any uh, nuclear weapon or, or device which uh, they uh, possess or control. However, we do believe that this article could be clearer and more precise. Under 7.1, we propose that there be a deletion of a sentence in a position to do so, so that this article will fall into line with Article 5 of the Convention on Cluster Weapons, uh, which is uh, the inspiration for it. The new proposal on Article 9 on the COP meetings is a step in the right direction. The level of detail, establishing a regularity and review conferences, the roles and the real uh, measures to be dealt with lie down the basis for a solid, robust mechanism which would mean that the treaty could be dynamic in the future. Costa Rica also agrees with um, uh, aiming at a 50 ratifications proposed in Article 16 when it comes to uh, those needed for the entry into force of the treaty. I would conclude, um, Madam, by saying that uh, this revised version is putting our discussion on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished uh, delegation of Costa Rica. I now give the floor to the delegation of Mozambique, followed by South Africa. Thank you very much, Madam President. I wish to join other delegations in thanking you for the excellent uh, uh, draft uh, treaty that uh, is before us. I commend your efforts as well as the efforts of your team. Uh, for my delegation, both the preamble and the board of articles are now in a much, much better shape. Uh, they are a very solid basis uh, to words concluding our uh, treaty. 
Of course, additional work is needed, and uh, I would like to reiterate our pledge to support you and uh, work with other delegations in making a uh, better text uh, of this uh, future treaty. Madam President, I do not have a written statement to make. Uh, I would like uh, just to make a few general comments as I go through the text. First of all, uh, if you recall, uh, my delegation had uh, suggested that uh, there should be a uh, new Article 1 dealing with the, the general scope of the present treaty, which would read more or less like this. The present treaty applies to the prohibition of nuclear weapons, thus leading to their total elimination. Uh, uh, this was our initial idea uh, because uh, we are starting uh, straight with the general obligations without uh, uh, telling what is the main purpose of this uh, convention. But of course, if uh, the idea is not uh, uh, valid, we will not uh, insist on it. On other uh, draft articles, uh, just a minor uh, issues. Uh, I will start with the draft article five on additional measures. Uh, usually, uh, in legal terms, we do not trust when a, a text is too crowded, too long, and, uh, and uh, has many ideas in it. So our suggestion here would be, if possible, uh, and for the sake of clarity, uh, to break uh, this uh, article in uh, brief sentences without changing its content. I think this can be done by dividing paragraph one, two, three with very clear and straightforward ideas. Uh, on article six, national implementation, we would suggest as many other some others had done in the past, that we delete the portion of the sentence, this constitutional process. We need to delete this. And the reason is that it may raise a problem of conflict between internal law and the treaty. Uh, as you, we know, Article 27 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties says that uh, a party may not invoke its internal law in order not to perform a treaty. So it is important that uh, uh, we do not bring into our treaty uh, this uh, uh, confusion. Uh, number two of uh, Article 6, I do not know whether it should not be included in the present Article 1, General Obligations, but this is a matter of uh, drafting. On Article 13, we are uh, happy to see the, the text, uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, instead of attracting uh, some delegations had suggested achieving, promoting a wider acceptance or adherence uh, uh, by all states of, uh, of the treaty. It is just a minor, a minor thing. Uh, on Article 17, draft Article 17, 
I think the text should just start, this treaty shall not be subject to reservations. We spoke about this in the previous debates. So we, we have to delete the articles of this treaty. So we just start, this treaty shall not be subject to reservations. Uh, on Article 18, I uh, listen with great uh, attention uh, the statement made by the distinguished ambassador of Ecuador, and uh, I, to some extent, I agree with him. Uh, in our opinion, this uh, article should should be shorter, even though I understand the reasons behind all this literature. But uh, uh, shorter or a complete deletion. Article 19. <clears throat> uh, this article, Madam President, is more about without prejudice clause than about the relationship. Uh, it uh, has no relationship here. Uh, we would like to see uh, a relationship that uh, speaks about the reinforcement and the complementarity with other treaties, but not subordination. We come from a part of the world where some wise women tell us that the good relationship is a relationship of equals, not of subordination. So we transfer this to legal theory, and uh, we think that uh, we need to bring uh, equality of treaties, uh, but uh, of course uh, talking about uh, their constructive a good uh, a relationship. So these are the comments that uh, the Mozambique delegation had to uh, uh, convey at this uh, moment. I thank you very much for your attention, Madam President. I thank you very much to the distinguished uh, delegation of Mozambique. The delegation of South Africa has the floor followed by Liechtenstein in Antigua, Barbuda. Thank you, Madam President. L let me join other delegations in thanking you and your team and the Secretariat for uh, uh, the revised uh, uh, text. It has come a long way. It is a good basis for us to be able to move uh, 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 forward. The preamble is nearly there. It includes many of the elements that were discussed uh, when we met as, 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 as parties. The core prohibitions also broadly reflect the views that were expressed during the debates that we, we have. We agree with Nigeria and, and Mozambique that between Article 1 and the preamble, we need to have an articulation of the primary object of what we're doing as embodied in the name of the conference to negotiate a legally binding instrument to prohibit. So between obligations and the preamble, we need to stand that firm. We're willing to work uh, with other delegations to see how best we, 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 we do that. Madam President, I could go on and on and on like other delegations with a laundry list <laughs> go on and on like other delegations, uh, churning out a laundry list of things that we would like to include, things that need to be changed, things that need to have this and that and that and that and that done to them. But my delegation believes that you've taken us to a point where we now need to go beyond the bridge and negotiate and give back to you in clear terms what we think ought to go to the text. Otherwise, when we engage in a process of reading out national laundry lists of things that we want, naturally that leaves you and the Secretariat wondering what exactly it is that should be the ultimate version of the articulation of our wishes that fulfills the criteria of 
legal, is, legal soundness, technical accuracy, and political wisdom, as it were. It's important that we transition to negotiations, where we can go line by line or section by section, collectively addressing uh, 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 issues that remain. And I don't believe that we're far apart. We're, we're nearly there. We just need to be in one common space where we deal with Articles 2 and 5. An attempt has been made to cover or to express the things that South Africa had suggested, but we're not nearly there. But I doubt that all parties understand how far we went or what is it that we fully uh, 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 developed working with other parties. But this is a very good basis for us to be able now collectively, similarly in one room, to be able to negotiate and develop this very tricky part of two to five together. We would urge that we, 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 we heed the, the, the requests that have been made by other delegations, that we quickly transition to negotiation mode. It is not ultimately going to be the Secretariat that gives us a treaty, nor is it going to be an expert team that produces a treaty. At the end of the day, for that treaty to have legitimacy and for state parties to have a sense of ownership of it, we must get into a platform where we negotiate. Whether we have civil society present or not, I will leave it up to you to determine at what stage we go into variants of privacy and variants of openness. I thank you. I thank the distinguished delegation of South Africa. The delegation of Liechtenstein has the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, my delegation is grateful to you and your team and the Secretariat for all the efforts you've put into the revision of this text. It's obviously been a huge effort from your side and a great improvement as far as the substance is concerned. We welcome your text as a truthful and good reflection of the progress we've made in the room and we have a very good basis to work uh, to get to the last mile and conclude uh, our common goal, to have a treaty achieved by the deadline of 7th July. The preamble is a particularly good example of uh, how you brought the views, the diverging views in the room together to find common ground. And I believe in that particular part we're really very close uh, to have a final text. Going ahead, my delegation uh, believes that it's going to be important to focus on Articles 2 to 5. As many have said, in particular also now the distinguished ambassador of South Africa, this is the technically most complex part and the politically most sensitive, but there already has been a lot of work done on this on which we can build and use conversions that we find among ourselves under your guidance. Um, going forward from my delegations, the text in its revised form still has a number of issues both on the technical and substantial level to be dealt with. We will have suggestions to further improve the text at some stages. Uh, I recognize a number of improvements have gone into the text already and parts that were important to us. Uh, and we will probably focus on Articles 7, 9, 11, and 12. And I'm not going into more details now. Uh, but we will do so in a constructive spirit. And uh, listening to the discussion today, I'm very optimistic that others will do the same, which will provide us with a very good opportunity to agree on the final version of the treaty under your guidance. Thank you. I thank the distinguished delegation of uh, Liechtenstein. Antigua and Barbuda has the floor, followed by Brazil, Switzerland, and Thailand. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, um, for your hard work on this draft. For you and your team, um, we very much, oh, sorry, I should start off by saying that I'm speaking on behalf of the 14 member states of CARICOM, and we thank you for your hard work on this draft. Um, we very much welcome the progress made, and we look forward to working with you um, as we move forward to our mutual goal of finalizing this treaty. Um, we had a preliminary look through at the draft document, and I just wanted to focus in on um, a few things that that focusing on a few items.
first, first I'd like to reiterate or to um, state that CARICOM was very strong on positive obligations in this text. And um, we would really like to see language in Article 7 um, that obligates all affected states to address human and environmental harm and to recognize the rights and offer remediation, remedial measures to victims. And uh, we'd also like to see a deletion of the in a position to do so. That's in Article 7.1. Um, Additionally, Madam President, um, CARICOM welcomes the full participation of civil society in the remaining meetings, and we would like to see more public meetings so that we can benefit from the valuable technical contributions of civil society. I thank you. I thank the distinguished delegation of Antigua and Barbuda. The delegation of Brazil has the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President, and Brazil would also like to um, thank you and your team for uh, producing uh, this complete revised version of the draft treaty for our consideration. We are also uh, sending it to our capital for uh, analysis, but we are ready to offer uh, preliminary uh, reactions, and I think the first general comment that I can make is that this is a, a great improvement over the first draft and that in many respects it captures um, uh, uh, views that were uh, supported by a majority of member states during our fir first round of discussions uh, and, and exchanges. Uh, so I think it's, a, it's, it's an extremely positive um, step forward that we are willing to work on the basis of. Um, we thank you uh, in particular for including in the preamble, which we think has uh, achieved a, a great deal of progress, uh, 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 seems to comprehensively take into account uh, most of the comments that were made that I can recall. And we would like to thank you for including reference to international human rights law. We would also like to thank you uh, in particular for including a preamble on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, as was also proposed by a number of delegations, uh, and to comment that with respect to the nuclear test ban treaty, we still believe that the importance of it is that it enters into force, and that as it has not done so, it would be premature to recognize the vital importance of the treaty itself. So at first it has to enter into force, that is our point of view. Uh, general obligations, we understand that you have taken the decision not to change it, um, but we understand that uh, adjustments will have to be made at some point, perhaps by member states in, in discussions uh, specifically involving this article. It is a critical article. We agree with uh, those who have mentioned that perhaps this is the most important one because it's a prohibition treaty, so we have to be clear about what we are prohibiting. And uh, for Brazil, um, there is still a, a lack of a reference to the threat of use or threatened to use, as the distinguished ambassador of Austria has once uh, referred to. Uh, so we fully support including that uh, among the prohibitions. We also would like to see uh, the prohibition on test to be broader so that it encompasses uh, all sorts of tests, including subcritical and computer-based testing. We also understand that on D, uh, we should uh, add a reference to nuclear explosive devices after nuclear weapons, as that is uh, the way in which uh, this reference to nuclear weapons is made in the other um, parts of this Article 1. And Article 2 on declarations, uh, as was referenced by some other uh, previous speakers, we think there is a need, a very important and urgent need, to include a reference to countries that have nuclear weapons stationed in their ter territories, and they should declare so. Otherwise, it simply beats the purpose of the treaty. It creates a loophole and it weakens it completely. We cannot uh, attempt to uh, establish a treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons, that asks uh, nuclear weapon states to uh, eliminate and destroy their nuclear weapons programs, so on and so forth, and say nothing of those countries that have nuclear weapons stationed in their territory. 
this is a loophole that needs to be uh, fixed because it weakens the treaty and we would not support that. Um, we should also uh, have here the requirement of states who possess to declare that they do so. Uh, I think that uh, was a very straightforward requirement that was in the previous version and we think it, it should not have been removed. Uh, otherwise, again, it is not a treaty that is complete. Uh, regarding safeguards, um, we were ready to work on the idea of incorporating into the body of the treaty language that you had originally proposed as an annex, and we thought that would have been a pathway, a positive way, way forward that would find a language that could be acceptable to all. Uh, on the other hand here, we have a smaller uh, paragraph um, which perhaps has the advantage of reducing the issue of safeguards to its uh, real relevance in a treaty that seeks to prohibit nuclear weapons and not create different types of regimes on safeguards that are already covered by the NPT and the International Atomic Agency. And we would, uh, in this language, we think that a reference to higher level of standards, it's not technically uh, sound uh, nor precise because there are no higher level of standards. In fact, there are no uh, particular standards and uh, what the agency has, I have expressed this before, uh, are model agreements that are negotiated with countries individually. Uh, to agree on those model uh, agreements is a voluntary uh, decision of each particular country under the agency and the agreements, they, they vary in scope. And of course, uh, the issue here are states that have nuclear weapons and those states, they usually offer, uh, make offers uh, on their agreements and the standards uh, may be very low on those particular agreements. So I think there are no standards. Uh, we would not support uh, retaining this language in here. But again, we're willing to work on different options, including the original proposal to incorporate the annex language into the body of the treaty. Article 4, we'd just like to, um, to uh, also, oh, I'm sorry, also in Article 3, we support uh, the comment made that there is an absence of language to cover the situation of those countries that currently do not possess safeguards agreements. Uh, on Article 4, we would just like to point out, uh, we will study it carefully because it brings in a new approach uh, from the previous draft, so we will study it carefully. Uh, it seems to, to flow better from than the original one, so apparent, uh, I would say that the first reaction is positive. I uh, just comment that it mentions uh, the destruction of nuclear weapons program in 4.1, and then when we go to 4.3, it mentions dismantlement of nuclear weapons. So there are a couple of differences in the way uh, subject matter is referred to that I don't know if it's deliberately different or perhaps would need a further consideration. Uh, again, um, we think Article 5 is important. It does provide that flexibility that you have referred to when you presented the treaty. Um, we do appreciate the fact that it mentions specifically the possibility of having additional protocols to the treaty. This is referenced here and it's also referenced as uh, in the in Article 9 uh, as some of the uh, sort of actions, action points for uh, meeting of state parties. Um, we think that the Article 7 uh, is still uh, does not cover situations uh, where states uh, who may use or threaten uh, or who may use nuclear weapons or test nuclear weapons, uh, it does not establish any sort of responsibility on their part with regards to human victims or environmental contamination or destruction uh, in other countries or in other territories. And I think this is something that should be covered by the treaty because it's a situation that is very probable to occur uh, and that has occurred in the past and its uh, needs uh, to be uh, addressed. In Article 9, we see a new uh, language on matters relating to costs as 
uh, a part of the sort of uh, responsibilities of meeting of state parties, and then it cross-references to Article 10, and Article 10 now refers to costs elements in Articles 2, 4, and 11. So there's been an expansion of the issue of cost. I don't know if that's something that is a, of concern to the Secretariat right now, but I think this needs further precision because in Article 4, for example, it's article that deals with the elimination, the destruction of nuclear programs. Uh, that will have uh, costs, so I don't understand whether the kind of cost that we're referring to here is just Secretariat costs or whether it goes beyond that um, to uh, initiatives that obviously uh, state members will not in a position be in a position to um, to fund uh, directly uh, just through assessed contributions for the uh, operation of this treaty. Uh, we're also um, uh, a bit uh, perhaps in doubt about this uh, having special conferences to consider amendment proposals. We think this is not necessary. Um, this is already uh, established uh, as matter for consideration of meeting of state parties and review conferences. It's mentioned in other articles as well. So if they already have the capacity to consider amendments proposal, we don't need, in fact, to have yet another meeting of state parties under a different format exclusively for the consideration of, of amendments. Um, we think uh, we are being inclusive uh, in Article 9.4, as we claim, we state that states party, not party to the treaty, can uh, or actually shall be invited uh, and participate as observers. And in fact, we give them the option of fully participating in discussions as per Article 5. So I think we have reached the inclusiveness that we were looking for. Uh, again, Article 11. 11, that's where you refer to the amendment conference that I have commented um, before. Um, I think that um, perhaps in Article 11.5, there's the issue of amendments uh, entering into force for each state party. I was just wondering whether there should not be a threshold over which of ratification over which the amendments would be valid for all but that's just a question or, or, or a consideration that I pose, um, not something that I'm necessarily uh, attached at this point. Article 14, we believe, needs to be to have further clarification as to uh, the place and the date for signature. In Article 16, perhaps it's a typo, I'm not sure, but there are different references uh, for the uh, threshold of entry into force. Uh, 50 instruments of ratification in Para 1, 40th instrument of ratification in para 2, so maybe we should harmonize it at the level of 50. Article 17, uh, we also go back to our previous position that reservation should not be allowed on the treaty as a whole, not just the articles. So we would also support the proposal to delete reference to the articles. Um, Article 18, we think withdrawal is still weak. Uh, this is a very uh, central treaty. Um, and uh, the withdrawal to take place only three months after notification, I think, the date of receipt of no notification, I think it's a very short period of time. So it creates a, a, a fragility in the system for nuclear disarmament because all of a sudden, I think, countries can have second thoughts, withdraw and rearm, and this can take place in a matter of three months. And that, to me, is perhaps not up to the standard of um, uh, political and technical and legal soundness that we're looking for. Uh, again, we fully support your decision to, uh, in, to replicate Article 26 of the ATT in Article 19 on relations with other agreements. Uh, we do not think this establishes a hierarchy. We think it just clarifies that in what concern all the prohibition provisions that are specifically addressed and are the object of this uh, treaty that is independent of any other treaty. It should be able to stand on its own from a legal point of view. So it, it clearly asserts that independent uh, nature of this treaty and does not tie it down to obligations in other treaties uh, in an undue fashion. So I think 
It's an excellent choice, very good language. We fully support this language. Thank you very much. I should like to thank the distinguished delegation of uh, Brazil very much uh, for the broad and comprehensive analysis. I now give the floor to the delegation of Sitsen Falaba, Thailand and Guatemala. Madam President, my delegation too would like to thank you for circulating the text and um, your introductory remark earlier this afternoon. Um, like others, we are awaiting um, reactions from our capital, so my remarks will be um, rather um, of preliminary nature. Um, our initial reaction is that a number of areas of this treaty in this REV1 um, have been improved and um, I would like to thank you for that. Thank you and your team um, for improving the text. However, as you said it um, yourself, um, we have still a lot of work ahead of us. Some parts of the treaty and some articles in particular um, will require um, particular attention and further work. Um, and our delegation has a number of outstanding questions with the revised text. Um, first and foremost, I would like um, to remind us um, the parameters we are conducting our negotiations. That is the mandate we received from the General Assembly to negotiate a nuclear weapon prohibition treaty that would both complement and strengthen the MPT. We have, from the beginning of this process, looked at the instrument in this context, and my delegation will continue to assess it um, from this angle. Before this background, I would like to turn to more specific comments um, regarding um, Article 3 on safeguards. Um, there, I would like to reiterate that getting things right regarding safeguards is of utmost importance for the credibility of this instrument. You will remember our basic position about safeguards. Like others, we stated our preference that we build on the highest possible safeguards and that nothing in this treaty will negatively affect the non-proliferation and disarmament system, notably the IAEA verification system and the existing standards. We understand that the new version of the text is aimed at finding a compromise between the different positions and bring us closer to something that is generally acceptable. We believe that some aspects of the article will need to be improved, though. I wish to flag that we are waiting to hear back from our safeguards expert in our capital and come back um, with more detailed comments. Regarding 2, 4, and 5, we appreciate that you aimed at combining several proposals made and that you built on the work undertaken by a group of states. At this stage, I want to flag particularly that we have a number of questions about Article 4, notably which safeguards are required in the long term for a former nuclear possessor state, how do the different provisions relate, and is the text covering all possible situations and provides for the specific scenarios that the required safeguards. Regarding Article 5, we are not sure of the added value of this article and um, we're thinking that maybe we should, we should um, delete it simply. Turning to Article 1, we understand that this article has remained largely identical to the previous version. This is because, as we understood correctly, or as we think we understood correctly, there is that not been enough convergence among delegations regarding proposals made. One outstanding point for us is that we would like to reiterate the importance of not creating a new test prohibition norm um, through this article. That is, a simple solution would be that we just add in accordance with the CTB team. Regarding Article 19, we welcome the effort to work in this article. However, this is another area which we have to look at closer to understand the full meaning and the implication of the current article. Since this process is meant to be an effort to implement Article 6 of the MPT, this provision should be in line with this objective and this treaty should not endeavor to supersede the MPT. In this regard, I would like to repeat that our delegation would also need to get more clarity with regard to the trade, military, and other cooperation with states not party to this treaty. We stand ready to discuss how this can be best achieved. Regarding Article 7, 
Um, in the area of victim assistance and environmental remediation, our delegation expressed our wish to see the text evolve. We have made some suggestions in this regard, making it clear that these provisions are obligations. We also hope for the, for the text to be more specific and give guidance about the principles and methods which have been developed in other treaties. And last but not least, regarding Article 9, we do not see the need for such an exhaustive list. Just mention matters related um, of any of the article of the treaty it would be enough in our view. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of Switzerland. I give the floor to the, the delegation of Thailand, followed by Guatemala. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we would like to join others in thanking you, um, your team, and the members of the Secretariat for the dedication and, and hard work producing this uh, second draft of the REF 1, which is uh, a, a, a large improvement in our view. We thank you for your explanation also this afternoon about this draft and especially for Article 1 and why they, it stays um, as it is now. Um, we would like, however, to uh, underline that we see the need for strengthening this Article 1 uh, and we um, uh, reaffirm uh, the text, the draft that we submitted to you earlier before this Rep 1 draft came out. Um, we looked at uh, Article 4 with interest. Uh, it is an important article and uh, it reflects our uh, discussion so far. We understand that the logic set out towards the total elimination now includes both a join and destroy approach as well as a destroy and join approach. Um, however, um, there are still some important details we discuss further. And, uh, of course, we await instruction from Capitol on, on, our, on our full intervention on this one. But at this stage, we need uh, clarification on some points. First of all, um, paragraph one mentions competent authority. Uh, but uh, paragraph four mentions competent international authority. Uh, we understand that for these two paragraphs, the, the, the competent authority uh, are meant for different roles, but is it that in paragraph one it could be a national competent authority or anything non-international, whereas paragraph four would have to be international authority. Uh, this is important uh, and our preliminary view is that any entity to, to, to be entrusted with this job should be international by nature. Uh, it shouldn't be some national authority of another of, of a state. Um, we are also glad that Article 4, as it is now, include uh, weapons that or, or devices that are owned, possessed, or controlled. Control is very important in, in our view, but we are still concerned. Uh, and there we join Austria and um, and and Brazil on this point. Uh, we are still concerned that uh, Article 4 leaves out uh, a large chunk of uh, possible weapons or devices. These are the weapons or devices that are located at any place under the state party's jurisdiction or control. And here we're talking about different kind of control. We're talking about place under the control of the state party. We're not talking about the control over the weapon itself. And so this scenario is still possible. A state party has some nuclear weapons that are owned, possessed, controlled by others, but are located within area under its jurisdiction or control. Uh, and we need to deal with these. It is very important. We are also of the view that uh, in every instance, the provision for states seeking to eliminate their weapons should be held to the standards of the IAEA. Uh, and uh, we should also leave the door open for higher level standards of safeguards in the future. Um, on Article 7, um, we agree with uh, Brazil that, uh, again, it leaves out a large chunk that is responsibility of the users or testers state of uh, nuclear weapons. We should uh, look at establishing responsibility for both the states that use or test 
nuclear weapons, but also those who allow the others to use or test uh, in, in, in their territory or pl any place under their jurisdiction or control. Um, we agree that uh, uh, the inclusion of a clear reference to accession and uh, uh, entry into force now, it's clearer than the previous draft, but we still think that Articles 14 to 16 perhaps need fine-tuning. For example, um, Article 14 only says that this will be open to signature to all states, but does not specify up to or when. Um, and then Article uh, 15, paragraph, sorry, Article 16, paragraph 1, talk about entry into force and also include instrument of accession. To my understanding, accession only happens after entry into force. And so it would be difficult for me to imagine you, uh, triggering of entry into force by an instrument of accession. Uh, and also, Article 16, Paragraph 1 mentions 50th instrument, but Paragraph 2 mentions the 40th instrument. Um, all in all, I think we should uh, look at 14, 15, 16 again and fine tune them so that it's clear. And conceptually, it is important to, to leave the possibility for any state to come in any time. So accession will be something very important, and it has a special meaning for this treaty, perhaps more than any other one. Um, we are glad that uh, for Article 19, uh, the, the, the language of 26.1 of ATT is there. Uh, and then at this point, I think this is just about that. And we will get back to you once we have uh, instruction. Thank you. I thank the distinguished delegation of uh, Thailand for um, their intervention. Le doy la palabra a la delegación de Guatemala. I now give the floor to the delegation of Guatemala. And New Zealand. Thank you very much, Madam President. I should like to thank you and your team for the revised text of the treaty, which you distributed recently, and also for the detailed presentation of it. We think that this text is a balanced reflection of the proposals that were voiced in the room, and in particular I refer to the preamble, referring to the elements discussed in the first round of discussions. Progress is being achieved, and as you and other delegations have indicated, a lot still remains to be done, particularly regarding Articles 2 to 5. We have uh, sent the text uh, to Guatemala, and while I await uh, specific comments, I will just make a few uh, ones of a general order. Looking at the general obligations and the text, uh, no... Uh, changes regarding the first version, despite uh, the concern for most states uh, on a prohibition regarding deterrence and the threat of the uh, use of nuclear weapons, we would insist that we want to see a clear prohibition there. We also believe that the prohibition on transit should be shown in the final version of the treaty. The amendments made to the articles pertaining to the um, statement of and destruction on arsenal, uh, nuclear arsenals and existing um, safeguards are a step in the right direction. We support the inclusion of these articles in the treaty. However, these paragraphs should be clearer and more direct. The statements in Article 2 must uh, be attuned to the prohibitions in Article 1, uh, particularly the uh, stationing and deployment of weapons. Article 4 has been improved, referring to the obligation to withdraw nuclear weapons from operational preparation and early destruction and the establishment of an elimination calendar with the state's parties. Uh, the article must be clearer, though, and tighter. On Article 5, on additional measures, we believe that it remains ambiguous and the proposals of the new uh, effective uh, measures are not clear. The text on positive obligations, we also believe, uh, has room for 
uh, improvement and the treaty must in include the obligation of all states affected to help victims and uh, redress environmental damage. This has to uh, be made stronger and we also share Ecuador's concern about the balance that needs to be set. I have doubts again on Article 11 to, on the amendment conference and particularly on Article 18 on withdrawal from the treaty in line with what other delegations have said this afternoon. Regarding the indicative timetable for meetings, we agree with the proposal that you've made, underscoring how important it is to have the contributions of and participation of civil society. We need to use the uh, text as uh, the time as, as best as possible uh, to arrive at a text on the 7th of July. So that's what we have to say. Thank you very much. Guatemala, I should like to thank the distinguished delegation of Guatemala and I give the delegation of Egypt. Thank you very much, Madam President, and let me also uh, echo previous uh, sentiments shared by many delegations in thanking you and your team for uh, all the efforts that you have exerted uh, throughout uh, the time period uh, that we've had in negotiations, particularly last weekend. Uh, this uh, REV1 that we have before us, or the version that we have in before us, is uh, definitely a better version which does in fact um, incorporate uh, several elements which uh, many delegations, including my own, had suggested throughout the first week of the negotiations. Uh, we do take note, however, that there continues to be uh, some other um, elements which um, have not been incorporated and to which we would hope in the second round as we go about in the second week that they would be incorporated and integrated um, into this uh, draft treaty. Uh, having said that, I think in, in totality, um, the draft treaty as it stands now uh, brings us uh, closer to the, uh, to the main aim of reaching uh, to a final treaty. However, maybe it does not re uh, reach close enough. Um, we still feel that we are far from a consensual document as it stands now, but we are ready to work constructively uh, with you, Madam President, and your team in order to reach to that final stage, which we hope we can reach uh, by 7th of July. Uh, having said that, uh, let me uh, present also my delegation's uh, preliminary views regarding uh, the, uh, this uh, version. Uh, we have sent it to capital and therefore my delegation reserves uh, its right to present maybe further more constructive comments and detailed ones at a later stage. However, at this stage, let me also present some preliminary views. Uh, with regards to the preamble, I, I agree with the, a lot of the sentiments shared by delegations that it does, in fact, is a much better version. It does reflect several of the uh, elements that some delegations have raised. Only two comments that I would like that um, strikes out within this preamble concerning PP14 on the issue regarding the slow pace of nuclear disarmament. Um, my delegation, with the support of several delegations, had presented some suggested amendments to make stronger language and we would like to see that uh, rephrased as it stands now and we'd be happy to present you one more time with, with some suggested language in this regard. Uh, in addition uh, to a second preamble paragraph, PP19 concerning CTBT, uh, the way it is uh, phrased as it stands now uh, for my delegation will find it difficult to accept uh, we had previously mentioned that uh, it, as it stands and as it is rephrased uh, in this manner, uh, it is factually incorrect. Uh, the CTBT has yet to enter into force uh, and therefore uh, we would uh, seek the deletion of this, um, of this reference to the CTBT as it stands or may possibly consider other options of reformulation on the lines of the delegation of Brazil which it had suggested making the focus of this reference to the entry of into force of the CTBT if we are to have a, a paragraph on CTBT uh, in the preamble. With regards to the operative sections, uh, we also take note that the in general obligations that nothing much has, has been changed. We add our voices to the delegations that mention the importance of making reference to the threat of use in uh, 1D. Um, and there has, has been also some uh, amendments suggested by delegations to which my delegation had supported concerning the deletion of references to nuclear we weapon test explosions and that is in the reference to um, 1E as well as in uh, 2B. 
uh, and also the reference to stationing uh, of nuclear weapons. This, these are um, issues which I think uh, we would like to see incorporated in the first um, article. With regards to safeguards, Article 3, um, again, my delegation is consulting with Capital on this regard, and we will come back with a much more concrete um, reaction to the safeguards. Uh, so I will not make ref not uh, comment on this at this uh, preliminary stage. Uh, with regards to Article 7 and uh, victim assistance, my delegation had suggested, uh, with the support of several other delegations, about the necessity to reformulate uh, this paragraph to make some reference to the responsibility of those that actually conduct uh, nuclear testing and that the onus or responsibility should remain primarily on those that actually conduct these tests while at the same time making sure that state parties can in their own capacity provide uh, assistance uh, to victims. However, we would still like to see reference to the responsibility of those that uh, conduct nuclear uh, tests that the onus and responsibility uh, remains uh, on them in, in particular. With regards to Article 18 and uh, the question of uh, withdrawal, uh, on the same lines of, of the delegation of uh, Ecuador, we would like to see this, uh, on, um, de this article watered down. Uh, we think that references to withdrawal should be simple uh, and not as it is mentioned in this regard. And again, we would be willing to work on formulated language uh, in this regard. These are preliminary remarks, Madam President, uh, regarding our, our delegation's view. And again, my delegation would be in a position to provide you with much more detailed comments um, on this draft treaty. Uh, I would, at the end, however, of my intervention, would like uh, to seek the clarification of the President as to the President's uh, perspective in the next uh, couple of days uh, during, during this week as to the procedural um, modalities and methodology to which the President uh, intends to go about in addressing this. Uh, obviously, we are running out of time. We have only seven working days to finalize this treaty. And it would be uh, important for my delegation also to communicate back to Capital on to how the President intends to proceed. Uh, are you still willing to accept from delegations formulated language as we did in the first week? Uh, will this uh, take too much time? And therefore, um, my delegation uh, remains at your hands as to how we will proceed, but we would like to seek clarity as to the procedural modalities of how to move forward. Thank you again, Madam President. I thank the delegation of um, Egypt. I give the floor to the delegation of New Zealand, followed by Sweden, Peru, and Mexico. Thank you very much, Madam President. We welcome the circulation of the revised draft and appreciate all of your efforts, plus those of your team and the Secretariat, to produce this revision and to take these negotiations forward. My delegation sees real improvements in some areas. I'd like to focus my comments today in the main on the key provisions of Articles 2, 3, 4, and 5. With regard first to Article 2, we note that the revised draft continues to retain a requirement for states' parties to submit declarations, but the new text only seems to require declarations covering the prior destruction of nuclear weapons as well as declarations on states' general safeguards obligations. As far as we can see, however, there is no separate requirement for a state party to declare any current possession of nuclear weapons or to declare the existence of any nuclear weapons on its territory, which may be owned or controlled by another state. And we note that a number of other delegations here, including Brazil, Thailand, and others, have commented on this shift uh, from the text which was being discussed here at the end of last week. We note, too, that the new text would seem to require the same declarations under 2.1b from nuclear weapon possessor states as from those few non-nuclear weapon states that have yet to have safeguards agreements with the IAEA. We think this is 
not appropriate. Moving to Article 3, Madam President, we appreciate the inclusion of the language ensuring that our new treaty does not require lower safeguard standards to be in place than those to which we are already committed. We are concerned, however, that none of the core requirements regarding safeguards as outlined in the annex of your first text, Madam President, have been retained and, of course, we note the deletion of the annex. For this and for other reasons, including those commented on here by other delegations, we believe that the text before us now in Rev 1 does need to be strengthened. Moving on to Article 4, as a general point, I note that this article continues to explicitly envisage a possibility which would be in direct contradiction with the obligation in Article 1. Article 1 rightly establishes an obligation not to possess nuclear weapons, yet Article 4.1 permits a state to join the treaty to be one of its state parties while still possessing nuclear weapons. We, th we think that there needs to be language incorporated here to ensure that this inconsistency is rectified. Article 4.1 needs either to be subordinated to the prohibition in Article 1 or reconciled in some other respect with the prohibition on possession. Further, Madam President, we think that the time frame put forward of 60 days in Article 4.1 is unworkable and Article 4.1, I think to ensure its general feasibility, needs to be fleshed out with respect to the process and the rules of procedure that would apply to the negotiation and agreement on the time-bound plan referred to in Article 4. Moving on to Article 4.3, in terms of the dismantlement of a nuclear weapons program, we would want to be assured of much more than just the correctness and completeness of a former nuclear weapon possessor state's inventory of nuclear materials. This point also applies to the assurances to be provided by the IAEA under Article 4.5. A few comments now, Madam President, on a number of other articles. On Article 14, regarding signature, we would suggest that, as treaties usually do, this treaty should include the time and place for signature, and we agree with Austria on that. Although we've yet to flesh out the detail that we might all expect to be included here in this provision, we would suggest including a placeholder so that this detail is not overlooked in coming days. With regard to the entry into force provisions, and Costa Rica, Brazil and Thailand have already commented on the discrepancy between paragraph 1 of Article 16, which refers to 50 signatures, and paragraph 2's reference to 40. We have heard last week comments from states that the threshold for entry into force should be increased, as well as comments that it should be decreased from that which your first draft set, Madam President, and we consider perhaps that your original proposal of 40 states does indeed represent a sensible balance. Moving on to Article 18, we remain concerned about the merits of a right to withdraw. Other delegations here have referenced this. We're alarmed about the possible effect on the treaty's object and purpose. At the very least, if a withdrawal provision is to be included, then we would prefer that an additional element of conditionality be included in paragraph 2, notably the obligation to call an extraordinary meeting of states parties, and we'd like to put forward in due course some um, proposed changes to other aspects of Article 18. 
Finally, Madam President, we think it would be useful to include rather more language in the text regarding the role and functions of UN ODA in, term, in terms of providing secretariat support for our treaty, and we think this could be usefully made much more explicit in the treaty. New Zealand looks forward to continuing our engagement with all delegations here in coming days. Thank you very much, Madam President. I thank the delegation of New Zealand. Let me give the floor to the delegation of Sweden, followed by Peru. Thank you, Madam. Uh, like previous colleagues, I would like to thank you and your team and the Secretariat for your very intensive work during the weekend. And we feel that the revised version that you have presented to us is a good step forward towards a consensus. We have sent the draft to our capital and will receive comments tomorrow. I, I foresee that the comments that we will receive will mainly be on Article 1, of course the most important article in the treaty. We look forward to working with other delegations on Article 2 to 4 in order to improve it, the text and to deal with any low poles. We also foresee, com foresee comments on, par on Article 7, 8, 18, 19, and we'll probably get back to a couple of paragraph or articles that we suggested as new articles and have not been included in, in your revised uh, draft. Um, on uh, en to entry into force, we were quite pleased to see the number of 50, and we would like it very much to, to stay that way. After all, this is not any treaty that we are negotiating. It is a treaty of uh, prohibiting nuclear weapons, which is, is an extremely important task, and we feel that such an important task, such an important venture really demands a reasonably high degree of uh, of uh, ratifications before it enters into force. So I'll be back tomorrow, Madam, with more precise comments. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Sweden and give y le doy la palabra a la delegación. And I give the floor to the delegation of Peru, followed by Mexico. The interpreters have told us that they can stay a further five minutes. So we shall try to conclude with our list of speakers. After Mexico, I have Chile and Algeria. If you have no problem with our continuing then in English, Peru has the delegate has the floor. Sorry. Thank you very much, Madam President. My delegation welcomes the new version of the treaty text that you've presented to us, and we appreciate the work and endeavors that the chair, your team, and the secretariat have made. The Peruvian delegation is uh, pleased to welcome the new text. We believe it's, it's a good basis. It uh, does reflect the majority of suggestions and points of view expressed by delegations. However, we feel that certain uh, uh, adjustments should be made and certain issues developed. We won't go into the details of the text. I'd just like to uh, make a few preliminary comments and uh, focus on a couple of elements. As my delegation did say when we spoke previously, the purpose of negotiating this treaty is to prohibit nuclear weapons and arrive at their total elimination. And this should be the main aim driving this conference. We should work constructively, transparently, and in good faith. And so here, my delegation feels that the reference to the threat of the use of nuclear weapons, which is important for us, has not been reflected as we wish to see. By this, I mean that there is no explicit reference to the threat of the use of nuclear weapons. In the preamble, looking at uh, PP12, there is just a reflection of the a threat to use, uh, linking it to the UN Charter. In other words, uh, uh, couching this in a general fashion, which weakens PP12. 
Then another matter of interest for the Peruvian delegation is the inclusion in Article 1 of the reference on the prohibition of transit. Madam President, if we are going to produce, uh, prevent, sorry, ban the, uh, the use, production and development of nuclear weapons, we must also prohibit transit. And then regarding the article on the withdrawal of a state from the treaty, we feel that uh, when it comes to the possession of such weapons which are counter to international law and international humanitarian law, a withdrawal from the treaty should not be allowed. Then on education, my delegation very much appreciates the fact that education for peace and disarmament has been shown in uh, the preamble in order to uh, make people aware of the treaty and disseminate knowledge of it. Uh, lastly, my uh, delegation wishes to ensure of our desire to uh, negotiate a, a transparent document in good faith and therefore when it comes to the participation of civil society as far as possible, this would be highly desirable in the eyes of my delegation. Thank you very much. I should like to thank the distinguished delegation of Peru and I now give the floor to the delegation of Mexico followed by Chile and Algeria. Delegation of Peru and I now give the floor to the delegation of Mexico followed by Chile and Algeria. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we still have interpretation, so I shall continue in Spanish. First of all, I would like to join with other delegations, indeed all delegations who have taken the floor and paid tribute to the hard work that you have carried out in order uh, to produce this revised version of the draft treaty. Given the time of day and because you did ask us to make general comments. I will not produce a large list of suggest a long list of suggestions. Uh, I do take it that at a certain time I will have the opportunity to make certain suggestions, a series of suggestions, and the draft still needs a lot of work in many areas. We have listen to the comments made by many delegations and we share many of them indeed. I would like to home in more on the sequel to this session over the next few days. But just by way of illustration, there are two areas that I would like to flag that are of greatest concern to us in this new draft. All the articles are important. But we believe that we need to look at Articles 2 to 5 and resolve the problems there appropriately. That's vital. We believe that these articles still need a lot of work. First of all, there is the argument put forward by the Distinguished Delegation of New, La New Zealand regarding inconsistency between Article 4 and Article 1. Just referring strictly to principles philosophy, there should not be any lack of consistency if we just recall the Convention on Chemical Weapons, which prohibits chemical weapons and, however, develops a process moving towards the elimination of chemical weapons. In other words, it allows possessors of chemical weapons as states' parties when it comes to their prohibition. So there's no inconsistency there. The inconsistency could lie not so much in the principle but in the language, and that's where we need to work, and not in challenging or questioning the principle but in resolving problems of language. Then again, another issue, looking at Article 2.1.A, as it reads at present, it would not allow countries which still possess nuclear weapons and have not yet eliminated them being parties to the treaty when Article 4 deals with a process to move towards elimination. I would suppose, as indicated by Nigeria, that once again, this is a, a problem of language, including uh, the way in which the verb is used, the past as opposed to the present continuous, and this make it uh, very easy then to resolve this. But I just wanted to indicate by way of illustration 
that there is still a lot remaining to be done on Articles 2 to 5. Then the last article that I wish to bring to your attention just to illustrate our concern is Article 18. on withdrawal, specifically withdrawal here. We feel that the threshold for withdrawal put here is extremely low. And this is of the greatest of concern for us, not just given the need for the treaty to be a solid one, but also because of the incentives that it might create when it comes to its ties with other regimes, other systems, we believe that we should be extremely careful uh, to ensure that not only is it difficult to withdraw from this treaty, but we shouldn't um, create incentives for this treaty providing a way of uh, seeking to evade uh, provisions in other systems. Um, uh, we have then concerns regarding uh, other articles and suggestions, but my main point here is to ask you what comes next? What do you want to uh, do? I, I would uh, espouse what Egypt has said. I think the questions there were put by um, others. South Africa suggested something we could do. Is this going to be the road we'll follow? Or what road are we going to follow? I think it's very important so that this evening we leave this room knowing what awaits us as from tomorrow. Thank you very much. I should like to thank the delegation of Mexico, and I shall now give the floor to the delegation of Chile and Algeria. It seems that now the interpreters will be uh, leaving us. Uh, could we uh, move to English for our uh, conclusion and indication of the road ahead for the next few days? Chile has the floor. I thank you, Madam President. And uh, I will add the voice of my delegation to those delegations praising you and your team for the dedicated effort that you have conducted in order to provide us with the first revision of the presidential text. Although we have uh, observations of our own that uh, would add uh, to some of those made already by other delegations, uh, which are very much close to our thinking, and I can only mention uh, as an example those observations made uh, by the distinguished delegation of New Zealand, we will follow the prescription, or rather the uh, school of thought, of the South African delegation, uh, refraining from entering into a detailed uh, explanation of our points, but rather inviting uh, you and the rest of the delegations to go as soon as possible into the negotiation mood. Because, as other delegation pointed out uh, very accurately, we have little time. So let us go into the negotiation and uh, we will in that context, voice our own uh, observations and proposals. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the distinguished delegation of Chile and give the floor uh, finally to the delegation of Algeria. Thank you very much, Madam President, for giving me the floor. First of all, my delegation would like to join other delegations in extending our thanks and acknowledgments for your tireless efforts that you have ad advocated with your team and the Secretariat since the first session in order to respect our rendezvous of uh, July 7th by adopting an instrument accepted by all. In welcoming this second draft, my delegation shares the view of all the delegations that the second draft you have circulated can make a good basis to move forward in our task. Like others, we send this draft to our capital today for general feedback and instructions. With regard to the general remarks, my delegation joins others in appreciating the, inc uh, the inclusion of many proposals that we have supported in the draft. And in this case, we thank you, Madam President, in reflecting our proposal in preamble section in connection with the peaceful use of nuclear energy. However, as many delegations stated in their general remarks, 
There are other proposals that were put on the table are not duly reflected in the text. Just to mention, but not in exhaustive manner, in the Article 1, when it comes for the inclusion or not of the probation of threats of use and comprehensive testing. And on Article 7, when it comes in the formulating reference to render those nuclear weapon states accountable for their nuclear weapon use and testing in the territories of those affected states. Madam President, having said that, my delegation will stop here at the moment and waiting to come back to examine in depth the draft once we resume our discussion para by para, preferably by using the screen tool at that stage. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the delegation of Algeria for um, your comments and let me also refer to this overall exercise that we have uh, heard this afternoon, uh, here this afternoon. Let us first of all, um, let me first of all um, um, highlight that it has been a very useful exchange because, because it has been allowed us, it has allowed us to identify those issues that um, in the text that need either corrections or clarifications and that um, we can start working on, on them. Um, also identify those um, institutional uh, um, aspects or uh, provisions uh, for which very specific comments have been, have been posed and that we can uh, advance in consultations with the interested delegations before we can ref uh, revert back to the plenary. But the, the, the issues have been very well identified. The articles uh, that will be um, intervened in that, in that matter are also identified and we will we'll be able to uh, propose a, a, a way forward tomorrow with the identification of those articles for the institutional um, arrangements that need to be um, fixed and further reflect on them, on some of them, like article, the Article 18 and some of the um, 14, 15. There have been um, uh, the object of comments this afternoon. And last but not least, it has also allowed us to identify the issues that are the core of the, of the, of the talks and the, of the negotiations that need to go into a different kind of um, exercise of um, um, specific work, work first, first in, in informal consultations and specific um, facilitated um, negotiations already. Let me anticipate uh, for tomorrow morning that we still need to hear from, uh, to give the space to civil society on the general comments. Uh, we know that this is very important for the exercise and as uh, some delegations have already pointed out, we also need to have the overall conference to um, have a good sense of their, um, their view in this, uh, in this process. So we will um, reconvene in this room in this format to have a, an open but um, a private uh, session that would not be webcasted. So we can work in that format to go through Article 1 um, and start already uh, making progress on, on that regard. And um, it is my intention to move on then to Articles 6 and 8 so that we can have in the afternoon if we are um, if we make progress with those um, um, articles, we can devote already to the, um, um, the time to the discussion, the integral discussions, discussion of the um, cluster on articles of articles 2 to 5 in this, um, in this format before we go back to the informal session on, uh, on Thursday. So um, uh, as was also um, promised, the Bureau is going to assess uh, tomorrow morning the, um, the, the plan of um, action for the following week and we will be able to uh, let the uh, civil society organizations know in advance which are the sessions we consider that will be um, um, open and which uh, sessions we consider that will going to be closed so that you can have some predictability as well as to the time frame in which you will be able to interact with the delegations. We of course are moving into the, the negotiation mode but before we start
start uh, working on specific tests with uh, uh, text proposals that is something that the delegation of Egypt has already um, have, has requested um, clarification on. We need to um, have the opportunity to listen to, to the civil society and also to have a, a, a good review then uh, an exchange on Article 1 and have an, uh, an exchange on several uh, institutional aspects that have been raised by the delegations now so that we can focus on uh, the um, aspects that further need concentration from the conference which are